Oh, hi there. My name is Scott. I'm one of the ministers from St Matthew's Anglican Church, right on the Corso in Manly. If you're watching this in our building for the first time, or perhaps you've never been in the building and you're joining us from the comfort of your home, or wherever you happen to be in Manly and beyond, welcome to St Matthew's. We typically start our services with songs because we're a joyful and an expressive bunch of people. We really do think God is good and has been good to us and that that's worth singing about. If you're not used to that, I just invite you to enjoy the music and listen to the words. But without further ado, let the music play.
Can I start with an extra special welcome to guests who might be joining us for the first time, or perhaps the first time in a long time. I'm really glad that you've decided to be a part of what we're doing today on this, the first of our winter sessions with Dr. John Dixon. In uh, just a short while, John will be speaking from one of his recent books, The Doubter's Guide to Jesus. And we'll get to John in a moment. But really these winter sessions are exploring the process or the passage from doubt to faith and just about every Christian person has made the journey from doubt to faith. I certainly have and can in honesty say that I'm not completely doubt free even today and we'll be hearing from Lara one of our members who's also made that same journey from doubt to faith but I'm guessing that you're somewhere on that journey too and so I trust that today will be a helpful part of the process for each and every one of us. Well, Dr. John Dixon, our special guest and our speaker today and for the following two weeks of our winter sessions. Uh, he's a former rock musician and an Anglican minister. He completed his PhD in ancient history in 2001 and has been on the sessional staff at Sydney University teaching about Jesus and the New Testament stories or the Gospels for many years. He's taught in universities and colleges right across the world, including at Oxford University, so he's certainly got the chops. And he's written over 20 books, including one which was banned from New South Wales state schools for a whole 12 days back in 2015. So you can imagine he's got some interesting things to say. It's a real pleasure to have John with us again here at St Matthews. Sunday's, uh, or today I should say, is going to work like this. Uh, in about 20 seconds, Lara is going to share a bit of her story of moving from doubt to faith. Then we'll have some short prayers and a Bible reading before listening into John. Well, let's get underway and hear from Lara. My name is Lara and I've been a Christian for just under two years. My journey from um, doubt to faith kind of began um, when I was at uni. Um, I just met like some friends who were Christians um, and they started talking about their faith all the time um, and I was really intrigued because part of my doubt was that I'd never heard about God before. I don't think the word God really came up at all in my life. I knew a few Christians but I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and I saw, you know, on the on the grander scale, I just thought Christianity was bad because um, I've learned I've learned about in history, you know, bad things that kind of people had done in the name of Christ. Um, but yeah, I I think I think I had an open mind to Christianity at a community level because I knew like two Christians who seemed to have, you know, a really nice community. 
it was a beautiful story, but I just didn't think it was true. Like it, it wasn't, I didn't think there was any kind of possibility that that would be true because I just knew that religion was kind of a crutch that people had and it was, it was good for them, but it didn't mean anything to me. I go to a Catholic uni, so these two guys were always having chats um, with the Catholic kind of students at our uni and, and the thing about my degree is that it's really small so we all know each other and we're all kind of hanging around in the same areas. Um, so I think I just remember this one time where um, these two of my friends, they were, I just became friends with them and they were just chatting to the, some of the students who were Catholic um, and they were talking about, I think they were just talking about how the world was created um, in general. And one of them, he, he just goes, oh, Lara, what do you think? And I just had no idea. Like, I just had, I had no idea. Um, and I was so humiliated <laughs> because I like to know things and I thought I was a deep thinker. Um, so that's kind of how I started talking to them because I, I don't like to not know things. So I went home and I tried to come up with some answers and then share that with them. You know, my friend told me that Christianity starts and ends and rests in the resurrection. Like if Jesus didn't die and rise again, then there's no, there's no Christianity. And so that's exactly what I did. I went and investigated the resurrection. I'm a history major at uni. Um, so I wanted to find out about it and find out if this was actually true or if it happened. Um, and so I read Lee Strabell's Case for Christ, um, which is one of the most amazing stories of going from doubt to faith. Um, because he kind of had a similar journey um, that I did from being an unbeliever and yeah, trying to figure out if that was true and then finding out what that meant um, for yeah, believing in God and having your faith. Um, so yeah, I read Case for Christ and, and read the Gospel of Mark alongside that. Um, and to be honest, after reading that and doing some historical research, I just couldn't deny that Jesus died and rose again if I was going to put the same evidence to the Gospels as I would for anything else that I'd studied in history then I just couldn't deny that it wasn't true that he died and rose again so that was that was a big thing for me my my thinking switched from God isn't real to God is real um, because if Jesus came and he he did all the things that he did and he said what he said about being the son of God um, and saying that he was going to redeem us and restore our relationship with God through dying for us, then that's, that's who he was, that's what he did. Um, so I think, yeah, my default just switched from I don't believe in God to I do believe in God, but I still wasn't a Christian because that didn't make me a Christian and I, that had much bigger implications. Like for me to just believe in Jesus dying and rising again, is very different and had very different impact on my life to me being like I want to have a relationship with God and so it was how it was whether I wanted to and how I would enter into that relationship with God which was the next step and that was the hard bit it was going to be a massive identity change for me to become a Christian firstly but the second thing was like okay God is real he's is he just here like where is he he's God's been here my whole life and he loves me and he cares for me but I haven't seen him like I haven't I haven't known him like how do I do that kind of thing um, and so that for me was a big question and a big kind of struggle of like because I couldn't you know I couldn't see God in the way that was so obvious like a person um, but that was where yeah, the, pe the people in my life the Christian um, people at uni that I knew and one, one other friend who um, was a Christian they were really important and reading the scripture was became really important so I think that was just really important for me and just taking those small steps of um, wanting to know God and how I would do that and that was through prayer prayer was really weird for me because I'd never prayed before I'd probably put my head down at school and prayed once um, but yeah I, I just I prayed um, to God just in my room one night. It wasn't spectacular. It kind of felt weird, but um, at the same time it was kind of beautiful because I just I felt a peace about it and I knew that God was there. Um, and that's, you know, that was me having faith that God was there. But um, yeah, I, f I felt a peace about it and enjoyed, you know, talking to God um, and just getting to know God by through prayer and reading the scripture. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what I do every day now. Um, and I've gotten to know 
God more and deepen my relationship with God more. And yeah, God just, he's a big part of my life now. Um, the biggest part of my life. Um, and yeah, that was a relationship that has grown over time and will continue um, to grow. If you've got young ones, hopefully you've set them up for Kids Church Online already because now is the time for them to jump onto that. If you haven't set them up, open up the St. Matthew's Manly website on a separate device, scroll down to the Kids Church section on the front page, and with just a couple of clicks, you'll be good. So have a good time, younglings. Hi, my name's Katie and me and my family attend the five o'clock service and I'm going to be praying for us today. Dear God, thank you for creating us and the world we live in. Help us to be still and present as we pray to you today. We are sorry when we do not put you first and we ask for your forgiveness through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We pray for our nation and the world. We continue to pray for the coronavirus and all those affected by it. By both here in Australia and across the world. Here in Australia, we pray that the spread will stop and, the, and that officials will be able to contain the current cases. We pray for all those who are anxious about the future. Please give them a sense of peace that goes beyond our understanding. We pray for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and our Premier, Gladys Berejiklian. Give them wisdom and wise counsel that they may lead our communities to respond to this crisis with calm and generosity. Assist them to gov govern for the good of all. We pray for those on the front line of providing medical treatment. Please protect health work healthcare workers from both infection and the anxious frustrations of the patients they are treating. We pray for those in our community and beyond who are sick, grieving or struggling with any other issues. Lord, we pray that you will comfort and heal them and that they will know that you are with them. We will now take a minute to think or pray silently for people we know who need help. Lord, you alone are the hope and healer of your people. You have promised us the hope of a world where there will be no more sorrow, sickness or dying. Comfort and heal, God, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness, or any other trouble. Lord God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has promised you that you will hear us when we ask in faith. Receive the prayers we offer. Amen. My name is Andy, and I attend the 630 service. Today, we're going to be reading from Mark 8, verses 27 to 38. So I'll give you a moment to get your Bibles ready. Okay. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are my Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in the mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with the disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. 
Hi, I'm John Dixon, and uh, it's great to be with you back in my happy place here in Manly uh, for the next three weeks, sort of picking up where I left off in January. Man, that seems a long time ago. Uh, looking at the life of Jesus and the remarkable uh, contribution that he has made in the world. Uh, I may have mentioned before this extraordinary 2013 study published by Cambridge University Press, where two information scientists, uh, Stephen Skierna and Charles Ward, analysed the relative historical impact of about a thousand historical figures and suggested, according to their algorithm, that Jesus was the most influential figure in world history. And both of them were non Christians. He is incredibly influential. I think m many people agree with that. The problem is there are so many um, differing portraits of Jesus, impressions. You could even say projections that we have uh, about Jesus. You think of those 1960s, 70s films, which some of you have not had the pleasure of watching, uh, that portrayed Jesus as a kind of hippie figure, certainly white, uh, uh, blue eyes, and sort of hovered around, sort of above, you know, the, the worries of the world. Uh, this was um, broken in, uh, in its tradition by Martin Scorsese, the famous director, who uh, had this film um, the Last Temptation of Christ, where Jesus appears as a kind of uh, raging, earthy, misunderstood prophet, sexually repressed as well. Um, Mel Gibson tried to sort of bring it back to um, Christianity by portraying Jesus in the film uh, The Passion of the Christ, where basically Jesus is beaten up for 90 minutes, if that's how you like your son of God, and that's the film to watch. Uh, interestingly, Mambo has their own Jesus as well. This is uh, the Mambo Jesus who's uh, at the footy, and uh, this is the miracle of the pies and the beer. And of course, some people, like our new atheist friends, reckon that Jesus may not have lived at all. Um, the temptation is to project onto Jesus our own preferences. And in this short series, what I want to try and do is avoid projection and instead focus on reliable historical portraits of Jesus, uh, three of them, just one this week. And uh, we're going to be relying on historical and biblical information and trying not to sort of lay over, uh, over that portrait our own sort of impression of who we want Jesus to be. And today, uh, we begin with perhaps the most obvious of all the things you could say about Jesus, and also one of the most uh, misunderstood. It's the claim that he is the Christ, the Messiah. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit that uh, when I was growing up in a completely non-Christian household, I honestly thought Christ was Jesus' surname. Um, because people would talk about Jesus Christ this, Jesus Christ that, like you might say um, Bill Gates or Bruce Clark. Um, it just seemed like there had to have been a Mr. and Mrs. Christ, Grandpa Christ, and you know, down the Christ family tree you go. I had no idea at the time that Christ or Messiah uh, is a prestigious title for two religions, not just one. Uh, there is a Christ in Judaism, which is the first thing I want to explore before we even think about the Christ of Christianity. Every day, our Orthodox Jewish neighbors pray for the coming of a descendant of King David from 1000 BC, uh, who will establish Israel and give Israel peace and rule over all the nations. Um, here's something from the Siddur or Jewish prayer book that is one of the daily prayers our Orthodox Jew Jewish friends um, pray. And prayer number 15 says, the offspring of your servant David, may you speedily cause to flourish, for we hope for your salvation all day long. And in the... Um, grace that Orthodox uh, Jewish neighbors say um, over meals each day, 
there's an explicit reference to the Messiah. Have mercy, our God, on Israel, your people, on the monarchy of the house of David, your anointed. And we see here the all-important word, anointed. This is the word Mashiach in Hebrew, or Christos in Greek, Messiah, a Christ. And this idea of an anointed one, a Messiah or a Christ, goes back to the Jewish scriptures, or what Christians call the Old Testament. So King David himself, uh, 1000 BC, or about that, um, in Samuel 16, is anointed when he becomes king. The Lord said to Samuel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed, this is the word Mashiach or Christos, David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully on David. Um, the anointing is the anointing of a king who would rule on God's behalf. Now, uh, later prophets in Israel drew on this idea and predicted that there would one day come a truly anointed one who would have all of God's spirit to rescue Israel and rule the nations. For example, Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, that's David's family name, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him. This is the Christ or Messiah that our Jewish neighbors the Orthodox Jewish neighbors anyway, pray for every day, long for. In the Jewish faith, the Christ or Messiah is the king descended from David and anointed by God to save Israel and rule the nations. And the thing is, it's only when we really get this that we can appreciate the scandal at the heart of the Christian faith. The claim that Jesus is this Messiah. He is Christos. And so let's pivot to Christ in Christianity. This is the claim at the heart of the Gospels, those first century biographies of his life. In fact, it almost literally is the heart of Mark's gospel in uh, our passage today in Mark chapter 8. The interesting thing is, if you um, unraveled an original scroll of Mark's gospel and folded it right in the middle, it would fall on our passage today, Mark chapter 8, where Peter declares Jesus to be the Christ. This is literally the heart of the gospel. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are Ho Christos, Messiah. A Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So Jesus asks them who they reckon he is. And it's a question you'd want to get right. I mean, they've seen for a couple of years by now, uh, Jesus teaching extraordinary things, um, healing people. They've gained an impression. And in the middle of his public ministry, he turns to them and he says, well, who do you say I am? And Peter gets it right. Jesus is more than a teacher. A healer, he's more than a prophet. He is Ho Christos. He is the Messiah. It is really difficult to exaggerate how big a deal this title is in the New Testament. Um, I mean, just to do a simple uh, word count and compare this word with lots of other really big ticket items in the New Testament, consider this. The word saviour appears 25 times in the New Testament. It's a, it's a really important idea, obviously. Uh, 
Uh, the word teacher, didaskalos, appears 50 times. It's pretty important. What about the word love, agape? It's 100 times, as you'd kind of expect. But Christos, Messiah, appears 500 times in the New Testament. It is a really big deal. And it's a claim that was heard well outside Christian circles. Non-Christians heard that people thought Jesus was the Christ. Here are a couple of really good examples from the ancient world, non-Christian texts. Uh, this is uh, Josephus in Jewish antiquities. He's a um, first century Jewish writer, not a Christian writer. And yet he mentions, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man. He was one who wrought surprising feats and was a teacher. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. He was called the Christ. And the tribe of Christians, so-called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. Almost sounds like he thinks Christianity will disappear any moment now. I think you'd get a shock how it all turned out. Here's uh, Tacitus, the greatest of ancient Rome's chroniclers. I mean, in classics and ancient history departments, they rely on Tacitus more than probably any other writer from the period. But he mentions in passing that Christians derived their name from a man called Christ, who during the reign of Emperor Tiberius had been executed by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. The central unapologetic claim of Christianity is that Jesus is this descendant of King David, anointed by God to save Israel and rule the nations. Uh, Jesus is, according to Christianity, the Christ. The difference between the first century Jewish expectation uh, of who the Christ would be and the Christ that the Christians proclaimed as a result of what Jesus taught is pretty clear. Uh, Jesus said he would rule as Christ, not by the sword, but by a cross. He is Christ on a cross. Um, the historical thing to understand is that many in Jesus' day um, longed for a ruler who would conquer the Romans. The Romans had um, occupied Israel from 63 BC. And by the time of Jesus, people were fed up and wanted the Messiah to come and smash the sinners and establish Israel uh, as a place of peace and rule over the nations. And so Christ and Messiah was interpreted in a military fashion, even by many of Jesus' own disciples. Um, here's a good example. This is a manifesto uh, written by Jewish leaders in Jerusalem uh, about 50 BC, so just a decade or so after the Romans arrived. And it describes the contemporary Jewish hopes for uh, the Messiah. I got to play with this particular text called the Psalms of Solomon uh, some years ago. But here's the job description of the Messiah. See, O Lord, and raise up for them their king, the son of David, to rule over your servant Israel. Undergird him with the strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles, in righteousness to drive out the sinners, to smash the arrogance of sinners, there will be no unrighteousness among them in his days, for their king shall be the Lord Messiah. This is what Peter and no doubt some of the other disciples were hoping for in their Messiah. And that's why Peter can't cope with what Jesus says next in our passage. So Peter declares Jesus to be the Messiah the Christ. Jesus warns them not to tell anyone about him yet, because he's got a lot more to teach them about, about what this means. But then we read, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter was so taken by the military 
idea of a Messiah, that he has the audacity to rebuke Jesus, whom he's just declared Messiah, when Jesus says he's going to die instead of conquer. Uh, Peter obviously was projecting onto Jesus his own preferences, something that's really easy to do. But he must have got the shock of his life when, according to this passage, um, Jesus turns his back on Peter. That's what's going on here, because Peter rebukes Jesus, and then it says Jesus turned to his disciples, in other words, put Peter to his back and said, get behind me, Satan. When the one you've just called Messiah says, get behind me, Satan, you know you're in trouble, <laughs> you've made a big mistake. I mean, the thing is, um, Peter doesn't have in mind the concerns of God, Jesus says, but earthly concerns, military concerns. Because the concern of God, according to Jesus, is that the Messiah would die. He would suffer and give his life on a cross because God doesn't want to destroy his enemies. He's not about conquering. He's about saving. He wants to welcome his own enemies into his family. This is why Jesus' mission was to die not conquer. He was to bear the judgment the enemies of God deserve. Instead of seeing them conquered, he wanted to save them so they might be welcomed. You know, um, friends of mine have these um, mates in town who own a really posh uh, jewellery store. And uh, some years ago now, quite a few years ago now, and this American gentleman walked into their store and asked if he could buy a pink argyle diamond. These things are worth about 20 grand. And that, they were the kind of shop that had that. And as they were doing the transaction and the guy was purchasing the diamond, the computer froze. And the American gentleman just leant over, uh, offered a bit of advice, and the computer came back to life. And the woman, the, this friend of my friend, uh, said, oh, you know a little about computers, do you? And he just smiled and um, nodded and finished the transaction and walked out of the store. Only later, when they were looking through the receipts, did she zero in on the name of the person she'd just sold this to. Um, she had literally just sold a pink argyle diamond to a Mr. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft. And um, you can imagine she felt a little silly for having asked him do you know a little about computers when this is the guy who changed the computer industry uh, worldwide? I mean, that's a true story, but it also reminds me of something that is equally true of our topic. Uh, people have low estimations of Jesus when he's right in front of them. Uh, some people just underestimate uh, Jesus, think of him as a life coach or a teacher or something. Others um, have a reverence for Jesus, maybe even think of him as divine, but have overlooked that his real mission was to die and rise for us, not to just be the conqueror, the Lord, but to save us and welcome us into God's family. Um, both are projections onto Jesus of our own thoughts and preferences, when the truth is Jesus as the Christ has all of the authority of God and all of the love of someone who would give himself for us so that we'd be welcomed into God's kingdom. Sorry? Okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Only now in the hands of created. 
find me now Where the grace runs as deep as your scars You pull me from the clay You set me on a rock You call me by your name Make my heart whole again Lift it up in my knees now it's all for your glory That I might stand With more reasons to sing and to fear You pull me from the clay You set me on a rock You call me by your name Made my heart whole again So here I stand High in surrender I need you now Hold my heart Now and forever My soul cries out Once I was broken you love my whole heart through Sin has no hold on me Cause your grace holds me now And that grace Holds the ground where the grave did Where all my shame remains Left for dead in your you crashed on edge again You left no stone unturned You stepped out of that grave Showed it me all the way So here I stand High in surrender I need you Well, thanks to John for helping us understand what calling Jesus the Christ really means. All the authority of God with all the love of one who has given himself for us in his life, death and resurrection. I reckon that's good stuff. If you think it's good stuff too, you might like to know more. Uh, and you might be interested in jumping into an online course we're running here that's called Alpha. You may well have heard of Alpha. It's pretty well known right across the world. But the Alpha Course is a place to explore the big questions of life, faith, meaning, and God. Normally, we run Alpha down at church over dinner together, but in this unusual epoch, Alpha is going to be running online on Monday nights, starting on Monday the 10th of August. That's a few Mondays' time. The best bits of Alpha remain, and each session includes a short film and a discussion where you can share what you think with a, a small group of people just like you. But you can do all of that from the comfort of your own home. We might just watch a short clip to get a feel for what Alpha is like.
If you've ever wondered if there's more, you're not alone in that. We all explore, every day, in small ways and big. We find ourselves, reinvent ourselves, define ourselves, publish our lives. We find ways to stand out and ways to blend in. We meet people that remind us of us and people that remind us of who we want to be and people that just make the journey that much more fun. We connect and share. We learn from each other and grow together. We celebrate and mourn side by side. We push our limits, challenge ourselves, fall down and get back up again. Our days are long and our nights get short. We put in the hours in the hope of building something that lasts. And at the end of the day, find joy in the fleeting things. We want to squeeze all the life out of life and hit pause on moments we wish could last. Put simply, we want to live. And along the way, discover all we can, experience more, and find out who we really are. For all our searching, it's rare to find time to think and talk about the big questions of life. About faith and reason and God and meaning. But exploring is good. We're built for it. Well, if that looks of interest to you, we'd love you to register your interest using the online connection card at the top of the screen, or alternatively on the Alpha page of the St. Matthew's Manly website. And we'll make sure that we get to you all the details that you need. Other than Alpha, my only encouragement is to join us again next time for our second winter session with Dr. John Dixon. It'll be great to welcome you back again, just as it's been super nice to have you with us today. I really trust that our time together has been helpful for you. So until next Sunday, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and it's goodbye for now. <laughs>